this is Pirate Philosophy. In this series of videos, I will be describing an original philosophy, one that you won't find anywhere else, but it is one that is logical, rigorous, and dynamic. Welcome. And in this video, we are continuing our journey, which started with the postulates of a logical processor with sensors and motor outputs. In the previous video, PP9, Patterns, Time and Space, we discussed how the logical processes of pattern identification could be used to begin to make sense of raw sense data. And at the beginning, we talked about a very primitive logical processor, as might have been the case at the very start of animal evolution. But now, our animal has thrived because of its ability to interact effectively with the world. And a few hundred million years or generations later, it has evolved to a larger brain, which is better able to make sense of the world. It was also noted that the process of pattern identification is the only logical process or way that raw sense data can be interpreted without any form of preconception of what the raw sense data might comprise. The algorithm for this logical process being something like assemble the data, input a template, test the template, does it fit? If it fits, continue, otherwise return to step two and input a new template. And if it fits, then store the template together with a label. And while this process is able to simplify and begin to make sense of the world, world from the raw sense data, something more is required to create a comprehensive model of the world, such as we humans experience. So what is it? Let us look at some examples of the sort of patterns that might be created from sense data. And for these examples, I will be using simple mathematics to model the examples. So suppose your data took the form of one, two, three, four, five. Then the pattern would be N, where N denotes the position of the different data elements, and we might, for example, label that pattern as A. In this example, data represents the sense data, the pattern represents the template or pattern that best fits the data, and label is just a label to identify that particular pattern. So supposing then we had some more data which took which we can model as 2, 4, 6, 8, and 10, then fairly obviously the pattern would be 2n, and we can label that b. Some more data, 3, 6, 9, 12, and 15, the pattern identified then is then 3n, and we can label that c. And then we have some more data, 4, 8, 12, 16, and 20. So fairly clearly the pattern is 4n, and we might label that d. And do note that the identifying pattern is a compressed form of the data. Using the pattern, we can recreate the data. So now we have some patterns that fit the raw data. Where do we go from here? But what if now, instead of using the raw sense data as the input to the pattern identifying process, we used the identified patterns as input? Then we would have as our input data n, 2n, 3n, and 4n. 
And if we, this time we denote the position of the data points by the letter M, then the pattern would be M times N. And we might label that ZZ or ZZ, depending on how you pronounce it. What we've arrived at is a pattern of patterns. And this process or sequence of putting the data, putting the patterns back into the pattern identifying process as input data does not have to stop there. When a sufficient number of patterns of patterns have been identified and what might be considered a level two pattern, these can be assembled and used as input to the pattern identifying algorithm to generate a level three pattern. And this process of taking the output of a logical process and reinserting it as input for the same logical process is called recursion. And because pattern identification is necessarily a compression of the data, the quantity of patterns in each level will be smaller than the level before it. So then if we draw a schematic diagram for these levels of patterns, we arrive at something that has the shape of a pyramid, or more accurately, a step pyramid, with each level, each higher level being smaller than the level below it. So then you have your sense data at the bottom, which is just your input raw data. Then you have your level one patterns, level two patterns, level three patterns, and so on, up to level four, or however far you want to go. But in this way, we create a model of the world based on raw sense data. So let us look now at another example of how this might work. For this example, I will only be using the labels of the patterns to designate the patterns as the actual details of the patterns themselves would be highly complex. Nevertheless, it is actually the details of the patterns which are used in the pattern identifying process. And these labels, well, they're just labels. Then supposing at level one, one has the labels for the patterns of leaf, branch, fruit and trunk then these might be combined into a pattern which is then given the label tree. Then this level two pattern of tree could be combined with other level two patterns such as bush, flower and vine. And then together with tree, these might be combined into a pattern found which is then given the label forest. And that would be a level three pattern. Then this level three pattern labeled forest can be combined with other level three patterns, which might be grassland, river, hill. And then they might be combined into a pattern which is given the label countryside. And this would be a level four pattern. And the level four pattern labeled as countryside could be combined with other patterns for things such as town or sea. And in this way, one arrives at a pyramid of patterns. And this pyramid of patterns constitutes our beliefs or knowledge about the world. If you like, it constitutes a model of the world. And only through the pattern identifying process can we actually create such a model of the world? And the actual process of pattern identification through all these levels is a very slow and lengthy one. Data has to be assembled, possible templates tested, then the accuracy of the result patterns evaluated, 
before a final pattern is selected. It is a long process. And so for higher level patterns to be found, this would be best done when the logical processor or brain is not busy doing anything else, like evaluating raw data from its senses, searching for food, evading predators, and so on. So this would best be achieved when the animal has found a place of safety and closed off its senses, so that its logical processor or brain can focus on searching for higher level patterns, or in other words, when the animal is asleep. So this provides an explanation for why we need sleep. It is an essential requirement for our brains to create a comprehensive model of the world. And it is also an explanation for why babies need so much sleep, as their brains work overtime in searching for patterns that will enable them to make sense of the world in which they find themselves. And it should be noted that this explanation for sleep is emergent from the theory that we have been discussing, from the assumptions and logic already described in this series of videos. And the fact that it is emergent and it fits well with our experience is further evidence that we, on this journey, are on the right track. In standard Western philosophy, there is no philosophy of sleep. Even psychologists have no explanation for it. So the only people who know why we sleep and the logic of, of what our brains are doing when we sleep are you, me, and other viewers of this channel. And finally, in this video, I would like to discuss very briefly the labels that are used to identify patterns. Low level patterns, low in the pyramid of patterns, have labels that remain hidden to us, such as for the patterns that we use to identify light and shade as shadows, enable, and enable us to perceive a three dimensional world from our two dimensional visual data. But for the higher level patterns, the labels are equivalent to what we call words. Or to put it another way, words are labels for patterns. Words like run, tree, elephant, and so on, are all labels for patterns that have been created ultimately from sense data through the pattern identification process. And it is interesting to note that standard Western philosophy has no theory for what a word is. Here is a quote from something I found on the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy on the internet. The notions of word and word meaning are problematic to pin down. And this is reflected in the difficulties one encounters in defining basic terminology of lexical semantics. Or, in other words, they have no idea what a word is. And yet their whole philosophy is based upon words and the manipulation of words, all without any viable theory for what a word actually is. But as we have seen, and according to the pattern paradigm which I am describing in these videos, a word is a label for a pattern. So it seems, again, that the only people who actually know what a word is are you, me, and other viewers of this channel. Well, that is all I have for you today. If you have any interesting comments or questions about today's video, please leave them in the comments section below. And if you would like to continue this journey with me, then please subscribe to the channel Give it a thumbs up and ring the bell. Thank you.